Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. We're glad to have you join us today. This is our October 26, 2014 Reformation Sunday service. This morning's worship leaders are Connie Singleton, who will be reading the scriptures, and Becky Dimitrioff, who will be assisting Pastor John Pollock. Also leading our service is organist Greg Nolte and choir director Vicki Perks. Today will be the last Sunday for choir member Joe Brewer. He and his wife will be moving to Canada to care for a family member. Our prayers go with them. The prayer of the day will set the theme for the service and will be carried on through each hymn and through the entire service. When you speak the words with us, you become mystically part of the body of Christ. We Lutherans believe that Christ is present with us as he has stated that when two or three gather together, he will be present with us. He enters with us, stands with the pastor as he reads the gospel, and gathers around the altar with his saints and is present with us in Holy Communion. It is our hope and prayer that these moments will indeed be a blessing to you this day. Join us at our 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Sunday services at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio.
Almighty God, to whom our hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Clean the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in love, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will. And walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who was rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Now sing the first two verses of hymn number 504, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
top of the today's reading insert in the Word. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on the church with your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we listen to the reading of God. First readings by Connie Singleton. Mm -hmm. First reading is from Jeremiah, 31st chapter, 31 and 34 verses. The days are truly coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. I am seated to God. Psalm was sung by Becky Dmitrov. The second reading is from Romans, third chapter, 19 to 28 verses. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by His grace 
as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By what works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
to put up any yard sale they were going to have. She was going to have. And he kept resisting, saying that the suits and ties were just fine. But finally she convinced him to let go of a few ties and suits. And so the day of the yard sale came and the suits and ties were laying there on the table and a customer stopped and the woman and comes up and she looks at the suits and ties and picks up a suit and the tie goes, perfect. And with that, the husband looked over at his wife with his look filled with pride and being like, don't tell me how to dress and not to dress. Who knows style the better? Well, he kept that look until the customer then said, these will be perfect on my scarecrow in my garden. <laughs> pride. To paraphrase Proverbs, pride comes before the fall. Yet as human beings, oftentimes we can be filled with pride. As human beings, we oftentimes find ourselves boasting about our accomplishments, boasting about how wonderful we are, boasting about what all we've achieved. You may remember back in the days when a young boxer came out of my hometown of Louisville by the name of Cassius Marcellus Clay. And how he told everybody he was the greatest. He was going to whoop that bear, Sonny Liston, which he did. And afterwards, then he changed his name to Muhammad Ali. Well, he was doing a press conference one day and going on and on about how pretty he was and how nobody could touch him. And, and he was the greatest. And one reporter was tired of this. He finally said, hey, Muhammad said, do you play, are you any good at golf? And Ali said, I'm the greatest. But I just haven't got around to trying it yet. Some people just always bragging about it. I remember when I was up in Griffith, I had a fellow who, who I liked, and he would often come by the office and we'd talk, but eventually he would get back to bragging about all of his athletic exploits, about you know, what a good golfer he was and bowler and all this, and how he was a scratch bowler. Now my father-in-law owned a bowling alley here in town, and my wife grew up in the bowling alley business, and I to this day don't know what scratch bowler is, but he was one. And as he would talk, I would think about how he was trapped in the past. He was bragging about the past. He wasn't talking about the, the present. Sure, we all get older, we can't do the things we did when we were 20, 30, 40, you know. Bodies change, but we don't have to dwell on that past. We look at what we're doing now. But boasting and being filled with pride is something we humans do. And it does, it's not limited to our secular achievements. Unfortunately, there are those in the church who love to boast about their faith. To love to tell you that all the Bible verses they memorize, or all the books of the Bible they can recite from heart, or all the things they have done, and all the committees they've headed, and all the things they've done, this and that, and so what the life of the church. And you'd almost gain the impression by their boasting that they think that salvation is by deeds. That salvation is by works. But as we celebrate this Reformation Sunday, we are reminded about what salvation really is all about. That salvation has nothing to do with boasting. Salvation has nothing to do with pride. But salvation is by faith alone. See, when Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses on the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, challenging other theologians to a debate on the topic of indulgences and doing works, it was necessary because during the medieval period, the church had kind of lost sight of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. The church had fallen into a type of Phariseeism, just like Jesus ran into in his day. Remember the Pharisees, how they like to always brag about everything they'd done. Remember the parable of the Pharisee and the publican in the temple. The Pharisees, oh Lord, I'm glad I'm not like other men. I tithe every week. I pray in the temple all the time. I'm so wonderful. I'm not like that scumbag publican over there. And the poor publican couldn't even look up at him. With his eyes cast down where all he could say is, Lord, forgive me. Jesus tells us 
which one was justified. Tells us which one whose prayer was heard. It was the public. In Jesus' day, or in Mark Luther's day, just like in Jesus' day, there was kind of a Pharisaic attitude among the clergy and among the wealthy. You could do all these new demands that the church was making, going on pilgrimages, venerating relics, buying indulgences, none of it. According to what Jesus said, it brings about salvation. So the Reformation started, and the church was reformed, and we're reminded, we're reminded that salvation is by faith alone. But why is it by faith alone? Why did God make the plan of salvation so easy? To answer that, you turn in our Bibles, or you can use the insert from your bulletin. Turn back to our second reading today, the third chapter, St. Paul's wonderful letter to the Romans. And we're going to look at a couple of verses because it answers that question, why by faith alone? First verse we want to focus in on is the 23rd verse. Now, in Translation, if you're not reading from your own Bible, if you're using the insert, verse 23 says, Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, in the New Living Translation, not the Living Bible, that's a paraphrase. This is the New Living Translation. Actually, it's pretty good. Studying the Greek compared to the English they translate, it's actually better than I thought. They explain 23 or translated this way. For everyone that has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. See, we all sin. The word sin means to not gain the prize, to miss the mark, to not reach that relationship with God that we wanted. Fall short means to be deficient, to be inferior, uh, to be not what God intended you to be, and not having God's character. And it means to fail to reach the goal be left behind in a race. So all of us have these qualities. We can't meet God's standard. The religions of the world say, yeah, reach God's standard by doing all these rules and regulations, doing all these deeds and so rituals and so forth. And, but if you make one mistake, you've got to start all over again. And when you die, you just have to hope you did enough good things so that you can enter into paradise. St. Paul tells us, why by faith alone? Because we've all sinned and fall short. None of us have a right to be haunting or arrogant over somebody else. Because whatever their sin is, the sin we do, whether it's as noticeable or not, it's still sin and it still separates us from God. And so because of that, Again, looking at now verse 27, Paul says, Then what becomes the most in? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. And then reading it in the today's living translation, can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is based on obeying the law is not based on obeying the law, it is based on faith. So St. Paul is right there answering the question, why by faith alone? Because we can't boast about anything that we do. We can't boast about obeying the law of Moses. We can't boast about the deeds that we do. It is by faith alone because faith eliminates the pride of human effort. That is why Salvation is by faith because it eliminates the pride of human effort. The religions of the world, you have those who are prideful because of all the things they can do. Again, you have to go back to the Pharisees of Jesus' day. Oh, we are so wonderful. We can abide by all those laws of Moses. We wash our hands all the time before we eat. We wear our phylacteries the right length. We where do everything we're supposed to do, ritual wise, I mean, we're just so perfect. We're not like you shepherds and tanners and blacksmiths and fishermen and all you people who can't fulfill all these rules and regulations. So they're filled with pride. But who did Jesus say would enter the kingdom of heaven first? Not them. It was a tax collector. 
sinners. Those who knew they needed help. Those who knew that God was their only hope. <coughs> Faith is not a deeds like in religion. Faith admits that we cannot do it ourselves. Faith admits that we cannot measure up to God's law. Faith admits we need help. <coughs> now I realize that that is in direct contrast with what we're taught as citizens of America. As citizens of America, we're taught that we can do anything. We're taught that because of the freedom we have, we can be born in a log cabin and end up being president of the United States. We're told that we can come from humble beginnings and rise as high as we want to rise. That as long as we're able to work hard, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, have initiative, we can accomplish anything. And that's fine. That's the second we're talking about. And that's good motivation for someone to to make the best of themselves. But we're talking about the spiritual and there is totally different. In the spiritual world, you cannot pull yourself up by your bootstraps. In the spiritual world, you can't be what you want to be. You may want to be perfect. You may want to be the best follower Jesus Christ ever had. But you can't do it on your own. You can't do it by your own effort. St. Paul just told us. We all sin and fall short of God's standard, and there is no boasting, because there's nothing to boast about. We cannot have pride, because pride doesn't bring salvation. There was a wealthy man who threw a banquet. He invited all these people to the banquet. He came day in the banquet, and they all entered into his banquet hall. There was this long table at the fire end was the wealthy man's chair, brightly decorated. So the people again immediately began jockeying for who should be sitting right next to him and on down the line on both sides of the table. And the, the host was not in the room, so he wasn't directing anybody where to seat. So the people were doing this according to their own pride. And so finally the host walks in and you had everybody seated on both sides of the table. Two, four, six people up closest to the chair were just waiting, beaming with pride. They were so important, and the host was going to come and sit in that fancy chair with them. Or by them. Well, the host walks in and directs his servants to pick up his chair and bring it down to the opposite end and put it next to the people who were considered the lowest of the group there. The ones who were not filled with pride thought they were so important. And that's the way it is with salvation. It's not our doing. We don't have anything to do with it. It's all God. This is why when Nicodemus is speaking to Jesus, John 3, 3, Jesus says literally, and you can find one or two translations that today translate it correctly. Literally what Jesus says is, you must be born from above. It doesn't say you must be born again. It says you must be born from above. Meaning, it's all the action of God. It's all God's action to save us. It's all God who initiates that plan of salvation. It's God who decided not to destroy the world again like he did at the flood of Noah, but instead loves us so much he sends his only one and only sends us to earth, sends him to earth to suffer and die on that cross, to pay the debt of sin that we owe, to conquer death through his resurrection, to ascend into heaven 40 days later so that we might have that assurance of forgiveness and everlasting life. God does that out of his love for us. We have nothing to do with it. When those translations do translate John 3, 3 as you must be born again, what it's saying is, you must be born again, but it's by God. It's not by anything you do. As far as Nicodemus says, what, can I get in my mother's womb again for a second time and be born? How do we do this accomplish it? You don't. It's all what God does. A man was carrying a heavy sack of potatoes down the road. A skeptic came up to him and says, how do you know you're saved? How do you know you have salvation? Go man stop and lower the bag of potatoes on the ground. He says, How do I know I lowered that bag of potatoes? I haven't looked around. 
skeptic says, well, you know, you lowered it because the weight is off your back. The old man said, yes. And that's how I know I had salvation. Because the weight of the guilt of sin and sorrow have been replaced by the peace and comfort of my Lord Jesus Christ. So it wasn't anything he did. It's all what Jesus does. The religions of the world are like that sack of tape. The religions of the world put a bag on your back and begin filling it with all these demands and regulations and rules and rituals and soon it becomes so heavy you can hardly carry it and just look for a place where you can stop and rest and lower that bag off your shoulder. And the problem is then it comes time to keep on with your journey. Like you gotta pick that bag back up and try to throw it back over your shoulders and keep walking. Takes away the burden of the law. Takes away the burden of deeds. And gives us eternal life and forgiveness, salvation, simply by faith. Faith exalts what God has done, not what we have done. And that's the difference between Christianity and the religion of the world. Christianity. Faith alone emphasizes and exalts what God has done, not what we have done. That is how much God loves the world, that it made it that easy. So our response is to do those things that please God, loving one another, serving one another, helping one another, serving God's church. Not in order to earn salvation or good deeds, but simply as a response to that love that God has first shown us. And because of faith and the power of the Holy Spirit that goes with faith, God through Jesus Christ enables us to do things we never thought we'd be able to do. The Holy Spirit calls us to ventures that we never thought we'd take. And be sure if he calls you to a venture, he's going to equip you with the gifts you need to do that venture. Sometimes modern day Christians think that that was all the church in the past. They can't take a leap of faith today. That's dangerous. Somebody might think you're a nut. Fanatic. But God is calling us to take leaps of faith all the time. There's an old preacher down home one Sunday said to his congregation, he said, I've stopped expecting you to make leaps of faith, but it would be nice to see you make a hop now and then. And that goes the same for us. Maybe God doesn't expect us to make leaps anymore, but at least we can make a hop. At least we can do a hop of faith because of all that God has done for us. Why is salvation by faith alone? So that we will not close. So that we have no pride. So that we exalt God because he's done it all. As he says in 28, so we are made right with God through faith and not by vain law. We are regarded as innocent, rendered innocent, through faith, not by accumulation of works. Why? Anyone would leave the Christian faith and go to some world religion and take on all that burden. I'll never understand. You have a mansion being prepared for you in the kingdom of heaven, not because you're good. Not because of your needs to be prepared, simply because of your faith in Jesus Christ. You are forgiven of your sins, not because you've atoned for those sins. You are forgiven because you believe that Jesus Christ atoned for those sins with his death on the cross. So we do not fill ourselves with pride. We do not boast because we have done nothing. God has done it all. We are saved by grace through faith. Because God loves us that much. Amen.
peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. As that you now turn to page 104 in the front of your worship book, to the words of the Nicene Creed, I invite those who came without difficulty to With the whole church, let us confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, the one being with the Father. Through him all for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified in a conscious power. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
God of all creation, all you have made is good and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. St. John practices an open communion for all those who are baptized and believe in Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior. We believe his body and blood are truly present as we gather at his table. Our communion agent and only individual congregation are invited and encouraged to come forward with us this day as we gather the table roll. Continue our celebration with the great Thanksgiving on page 107. The Lord be with you.
of Christ, give it to you. The body 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 of Christ, give it to you.
we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever.
Thank you for being with us today, October 26, 2014. Click on to YouTube next week for our service. Our Yuletide Festival will be November 20th through the 22nd. Please join us. Uh, call 937-323-7508 if you have any questions. I'm Linda Fox with St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. Have a blessed day.